everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, today's session, we're going to be talking about um, machine learning ops, cloud directions, and how to get to production data science. I like to talk to this, talk about this as going live and thriving. Um, this is joint work with colleagues, um, some wonderful people both at Berkeley and at a startup uh, called Aqueduct that we founded, um, and you'll be hearing about all these folks as we go through the talk. So the outline for today is to talk about this machine learning lifecycle in production. For some of you, this will be uh, something you know well, and it will be a bit of a cartoon. For others of you, hopefully this will give you a big picture of what it means to really go live and thrive with machine learning in production. And then we're gonna uh, step back and talk about the cloud and how are people getting code running in the cloud today and launching services, some of the pros and cons of where the state of the art is. And then I'll tell you a bit about what it's like to take research work, to take work that started as pure curiosity and do tech transfer to something that's really useful in the industry. And so I'll talk about the Rise Lab at Berkeley and uh, the Aqueduct uh, product and startup that we're, we're building and that journey and what it's like. And we'll close hopefully with some lessons from users that we've spoken to about what it means to go live and thrive with machine learning in production. All right, uh, those of you who uh, studied the water cycle in maybe uh, primary school will recognize this picture. Um, we have a similar picture in healthy machine learning in production. And it kind of looks like this, and I'm absolutely stealing these slides from my colleague, Joey Gonzalez, who did all the fancy animations. We work together quite closely, but he, uh, he loves his PowerPoint. So the cycle in machine learning production is, of course, model development, classic uh, data science, um, training at scale, and then inference. And so we'll go through all three of these, but note that they form this sort of cycle. So to begin with model development, I see model development as a little cycle of its own, uh, which has kind of two key phases. The first phase is data preparation. And this is the phase where you're identifying potential sources of data, and then you're augmenting them maybe with other sources and joining them together, okay? Once you've got your data kind of put together, the data that's relevant for your model, then you have to deal with data cleaning um, and data formatting and all the hard bits of wrangling data. So it's things like missing values, it's things like outliers, it's things like dealing with categorical attributes and making them numerical. Uh, there's just a lot of work, and those of you who do this work know that it's very time consuming and that you don't really know you've got it right till you kind of iterate a bunch of times typically by using data visualization and plotting to help you understand where these anomalies are and make sense of them. Um, I'm very intimately familiar with this space. We founded a company about 10 years ago called Trifacta, which was based on research we'd been doing you know, 12 years ago. Um, and so I've lived this experience with customers over a long period of time in the enterprise. Um, very time consuming, but with the right combination of visualization and uh, data cleaning, you can, you can get it done. And then the second part is the part we tend to teach in classes on machine learning. This is things like, you know, building uh, feature extraction functions and designing model architectures if you're actually like a machine learning researcher, um, tuning your training algorithms or specializing them to your application domain. And then, of course, going through training and validation to make sure that your predictions are accurate, at least in the lab. So this is kind of the classic model development. It's typically handled by data scientists. Once you're kind of done with this, oh, I should say, there's a bunch of tech that you can use in this space, and many of you probably have played with some of these tools, um, and that they can really help quite a bit. It's a very messy space. There's a lot to choose from, um, but there are a lot of solutions out there today. Once we've got our model developed, we get a model, and what's a model? A model is a function, and it takes a query, like what is in this image, and it produces a prediction. I predict that it's a cat, right? Um, and that's nice. And so uh, what is this model really though when we look at it? Well, it's a bunch of parameters, which you can just think of as data. These are numbers, right? Um, and in simple models, this might just be a few bytes. In bigger models, it might be as big as terabytes, or of course, in large language models, it might be even bigger than that. Most of us are gonna work with models that are pretty small is the, the real truth in the enterprise. And that's fine. Those models can be very effective. The other part of the model is its structure, how these numbers get used to flow kind of the data from the features into, uh, into the predictions and, and do forward and backward propagation. Okay, so you might say, hey, what, what's the output of model development? Well, one thing those of us who do data science know is that we get insights, right? It's, it's a better form of analytics and we can build dashboards and reports and that's all very useful, kind of a back office task, modest value to the enterprise, um, the other thing you get, though, is you get this trained model, which is this thing that you can reuse for prediction 
live in production, right? And so we might say the more interesting output of model development is the trained model. But that's actually a bad idea, which might surprise you that I would say this is a bad idea. What do I mean? Well, what I mean is that what we really want is a training pipeline, not a model. The model itself, it's, it's uh, not something we can expect and work, inspect and work with. The code, the pipeline that generated the model is something we can reuse. So we can, for example, retrain with new data to get a model that's more accurate for today. We can debug the model if we've got the training pipeline. We can't do it if we've just got the model. We can answer sort of uh, questions of governance. How did you come out with this output if we have the training pipeline in place? And go back and be able to say things like, the reason we predicted this is because of this data cleaning we did way upstream. Right? So that training pipeline is extremely useful and throwing it away and just keeping the model is bad news. Okay, so training pipelines are a description of how to train the model from data sources and we wanna keep it around. And the software engineering analogy for those of you who are developers, training pipelines are basically code. Trained models are basically binaries, right? And, and in, in the case of machine learning, we really need the code because we're iterating all the time. Okay, so we talked about model development, which takes us now to the training phase. And here, when I'm talking about training, I don't mean training uh, in your Jupyter notebook at your desktop, I mean training in production. Okay, so what's going on with training in production? These models are now running at scale. You can imagine, for example, an ad placement model, a recommender, a fraud detection model, things that run live. So they're running at scale, they're running on live data, and we need to retrain them regularly. When we talk to people in the fields, they tend to say that they retrain their models on a very regular cadence. Daily is a typical thing we hear. Uh, and this allows us, you to uh, handle things like changing distributions over time. Um, rather than think super hard about data drift and how to predict you know, why December might be different than January for sales, you just retrain the model every day on yesterday's data and you're only one day out of, out of, uh, out of date in terms of the distributions and that in many cases works well, but it does mean you need a cadence of retraining. You're taking a production system, something that may be serving lots of users, and you're retraining, redeploying models on a daily basis. So this training process has to run quickly. Typically, you're automatically doing validation of the accuracy, and you decide to launch the new model because it does better on yesterday's stuff. And you have labels in many cases from yesterday because of the way these systems are deployed. So for example, in a, in a uh, ads recommender, if someone clicks the ad, then it was successful, right? So you have some labels on which ads got clicked and which ones didn't. So it's pretty automatic to do validation. You need to manage all these versions, right? You're thinking about rolling out new model. Well, should you roll it out, should you not? And if that model goes into production and isn't doing well and somebody's beeper goes off, they want to roll back to a model from yesterday or the day before, right? So dealing with model versioning is very much part of this process. Often you'll hear about people launching multiple models at the same time and sort of trials. A thing to notice here is that none of this involves what we teach in a machine learning class or a data science class, right? This is not really about machine learning. This is about managing infrastructure, data, and, and uh, artifacts that need to be launched, okay? So keep that in mind. This is, this is less of a data science task. And again, lots of tools that uh, you can go grab to help with this. Some of them are the tools that you used for training, like the TensorFlow stack. And some of them might be very different tools that are really about managing infrastructure, like say Apache Airflow, okay? We talked about model development, how it leads to training pipelines. We talked about training in the field. Let's close the loop now and talk about inference. So inference is the third stage, and this is the stage that we really care about. This is where the ka is, right? Uh, when you show the ad, when you show the recommendation, when you prevent the fraud, that's where the business value is. Uh, the back office uh, data science doesn't pay off until we put our models into production, okay? So this is a really important part of the pipeline. Interestingly, it's a part that gets relatively little attention from the machine learning community. When you talk about data science, when you talk about machine learning, people don't talk about live inference that often. But by gosh, in the field, this is where the dollars are. Okay, and it's also where a different set of challenges lie because the goal in a live system is to make predictions in let's say 10 milliseconds while you're under a heavy load, right? Your users are on their phones, they're at their web browsers, and they want interactive behavior, which means that you're doing machine learning inference in the same time it takes to say load a web page. 
Okay, and this can be really challenging when we're starting to look at richer models like deep neural nets. Um, and new machine learning algorithms and systems have been developed to try to do inference very quickly uh, in a variety of ways. So I'm happy to say that I've been working with Joey for now almost a decade because he built one of the early and most influential systems for model serving. It was called Clipper. It was one of the first pieces of research in the machine learning community that really focused on inference. And it was quite influential. It was adopted by a bunch of companies, and it also influenced some of the uh, systems that people are using today, like uh, TensorFlow Serving uh, was very much influenced uh, by Clipper, and there was a lot of conversations between our team at Berkeley that Joey led and the TensorFlow folks. So um, this is the big picture, right? Model development, training, and inference. I should confess that unlike Joey, I'm a data guy. I was brought up in databases. I work on all kinds of things related to data, user interfaces, um, visualization, machine learning too. Um, and when I look at a system like this, I say, well, where's the data, okay? As you know, like modern machine learning is a very data-driven uh, uh, phenomenon. There is really no machine learning without data. So it's, a, it's not just a bias of mine, it's actually fundamental to modern AI that we understand the data pipelines. And what we see in this picture is that data is absolutely everywhere. It's just what I said. It's so important to the whole thing in every stage. And perhaps the most interesting thing I've circled here is on the far right that I've circled queries and predictions as data. We're going to talk about that quite a bit. Okay, We'll come back to that. So as I say, uh, data is life. If you're a fan of Ted Lasso, uh, I've adopted uh, Danny Rojas' saying because um, I think he's a good, cheerful warrior. Um, Data is great. It should make us happy. This is the thing that you know makes data science and machine learning hum. And there should be a virtuous cycle. If it's life, right? If it's the lifeblood of our systems, which it is, it really needs to pump. It needs to go in a cycle. And so we get input data, like training and validation data, and we generate output data that we flow back in. So it's both output and input. And again, as I said, predictions are data because we're going to use them as part of, but not all of, feedback into the system to close the loop. And when your data is not flowing in a virtuous cycle, uh, your system dies. So machine learning really will stop working if you don't kind of keep doing this. So this virtuous cycle is key to machine learning in production. Okay, so let's talk more about this. We've said that model development generates this code, um, which is our uh, pipelines. Here's our virtuous cycle in production from training to inference and back. So the queries and the predictions and all those logs come back into the training environment. They're used as training data for tomorrow, right? Which generates new models, which closes the loop. And this is happening on a daily or even faster basis in many organizations. There's also a somewhat slower loop where eventually your model might stop working, even though you're retraining it. And you need to go back to the drawing board and think about a more sophisticated model or a model that's somehow a different kind of model uh, to do this uh, task better. And so we have a fast loop, which is this virtuous cycle, and then we might have a much slower loop involving actual research, so to speak, um, you know, model development. Uh, so there's sort of cycles within cycles here. Okay, so I went through this sort of machine learning life cycle in production. And for some of you, again, as I said, this may be very familiar territory. I might even have oversimplified it. For others of you, hopefully it gave you perspective on kind of what it means to have machine learning really happening in a production environment. So the next thing I want to talk about is what makes this hard. And there's really three key challenges in, in this, in, you know, uh, what people are calling ML ops, ML operations. And the three key challenges I would identify are the first is that the virtual cycle, virtuous cycle is bogged down from in, by infrastructure. The second is that data scientists are out of the loop. And the third is that the core data stack is out of the loop. So let me go through these uh, together. Okay. So the first one, if you've looked at that, uh, virtuous cycle. What do people use to deploy this stuff? They're using a lot of these very heavyweight infrastructure solutions for the cloud. Things like Kubernetes, Amazon EC2, Kafka, Apache Airflow, maybe monitoring with a general purpose application monitoring tool like Datadog. These are not tools that data scientists typically work with. Okay, It's not that they can't be learned. Data scientists are very good. But these are kind of back-end folks tools. Um, and they have their own ecosystems and their own chat rooms and their own support systems. And, and, you know, this is the kind of stuff that people who want to operate cloud services want to learn. Most data scientists don't want to operate cloud services. They want to solve a real world business problem. They're higher up in the stack. So the fact that it's so 
sort of heavy to get the infrastructure running for MLOps actually prevents a lot of organizations from even starting. Or for those organizations that start, what they end up doing is they have data scientists who are learning to be MLOps engineers. And they're splitting their time, in essence, between all the messy stuff with Kubernetes, let's say, and all the hard stuff that they already knew how to do with uh, training models. And it's just, it's too much work. Okay, so that's problem number one, is infrastructure today is just ugly and it's unnecessary. We'll talk about uh, how we can make it simpler. The second corollary to that, the thing that happens as a result of that, is that in many orgs, data scientists are outside the virtuous cycle. So you get ML engineers or ML ops engineers to do all the backend stuff. The data scientists kind of live in the model development stage. The ML engineers actually own that virtuous cycle, which means the data scientists aren't in the virtuous cycle. That virtuous cycle is, is sort of where the juice is, right? That's where we're seeing if the models are generating business value, right? Are the predictions going well? And if they're not going well, that's not something ML engineers really know about because it's the data scientists who design the model. It's the data scientists who talk to the business to figure out the business needs. The data scientists are the domain experts. The ML engineers are the infrastructure experts. But if this thing is live and it's running, then the data scientists aren't seeing what's going on in a very easy way. And this cultural divide in an organization can be as bad as the uh, tooling divide or worse, right? Because now you've got people who have to talk to people or worse, teams that have to talk to teams. And we all know how that can bog things down. And then finally, and this is kind of just hurts my heart as an old school data guy, this uh, virtuous cycle is often disconnected from the data in the enterprise. So we said the data's everywhere, and that was kind of cool at some level, but if you're a chief data officer or an architect of data for uh, an enterprise, you look at this, you go, oh my God, what a mess. There's data everywhere. That's not good. What we'd much prefer is to get the data all in one place, let's say like a cloud data warehouse. So that virtuous cycle of data production can be examined side by side with all the other data in the enterprise. So this is good, obviously, for operations because it's easier to manage. It's also good for the data scientists because as they're thinking about how to augment their data pipelines with new data, it's all in one place, right? And they can go just kind of searching around in that data warehouse to see what they can find that would help with features and training, right? So you really would like to get all this stuff together. So now I finally want to talk about how queries and predictions are often fed back in a sensible architecture, at least, into uh, applications and into training. And it kind of looks like this. Imagine you have a table in your data warehouse of sales, okay? So this is a very simple sales table. It's got four columns, customer ID, product ID, price, and, and a comment that the customer might, might have left. I made this up, clearly. Um, but you can imagine a, a sort of simple uh, sales table like this. And the way we're going to integrate machine learning into this environment is we're going to have a couple empty columns, like propensity to spend and what's the next ad I should show this customer. These are columns we don't know. You know, these are, these are not data we already have. This is data about what might be true in the future. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our whole virtuous cycle and our inference to populate this table. So the predictions are not going live to the end user application necessarily. The predictions might just simply go into the database. Why would we do that? One very simple reason why people do this all the time is their applications, their web apps, their phone apps are written to hit a backend database. That's how applications get written. Applications don't always get written to hit your latest new machine learning infrastructure. So if you want to get your predictions into the apps, get them into the database. And then it's a very familiar API to be able to query those values and put them out into your applications, right? So now I can just go here and I can look up the customer ID and I can look up what ad to show them, right? That next ad field was populated by my data science uh, machine learning uh, cycle. Okay. Moreover, now in the feedback loop, we have all our data in one place and the whole operation of that virtuous cycle is centralized. Okay. So takeaways on this machine learning life cycle, data is the key to the whole thing. And the, the sort of tired way to do it is this high friction isolated MLOps infrastructure. I like to say MLOps as described in the field today is the Hadoop of our times. If you live through big data, it pushes the domain experts like the data scientists out of the story. It pushes the existing data repositories out of the story, and it creates a playpen for people who are highly technical. So this might be okay at Google and Facebook and Amazon, 
but it's probably not okay in your organization. Just as MapReduce was okay at Google and Facebook and Amazon, but wasn't okay in the enterprise. And what we learned is if it's not good for the general populace, it's actually a waste of time for the FANG companies. They can just afford the waste because they want to be ahead of the curve. So those companies aren't waiting for the infrastructure to get easy to use. They're doing it by hook or by crook. Most people can't afford that. So what's wired, you know, the right way to do this is what you might call production data science. So that's a phrase that, that we're using, um, where you get those data scientists into that virtuous cycle by making the ops problem go away, right? We're gonna talk about how to do that in a second. If you can do that, you can also get your machine learning data integrated into the enterprise data warehouse that makes predictions live side by side with real data, so to speak. And you get this ongoing life cycle health where you don't only go live with the model, but you thrive over time. Okay, so we had uh, an overview of the machine learning life cycle in production, which leads us very naturally to how do we get that infrastructure problem to go away? And the answer to that, that most people would raise their hand with is cloud. Cloud makes infrastructure easier. I don't have to run the machines. You know, Amazon will run the machines. Google will run the machines. Microsoft will run the machines, right? And particularly, there's new uh, things in the cloud like serverless computing that are supposed to make it very easy for folks like us to get our pipelines, our code into the cloud and running. So I want to spend some time on this topic now. And this is, you know, home base for me. This is an area I've worked in for years and years. Um, and when you think about the history of computing, I'm going to go way back to the 70s. With each new platform that gets invented, there's this sort of story we have in computing that a programming environment emerges that allows us to take advantage of that platform. So this goes back to Unix and C on mini computers. And the Turing Award was given to Ritchie and Thompson for their work on Unix and C. And, and it's much celebrated that it was the right kind of interface for the kinds of computers they were building at the time. And you can see similar things happening with supercomputers, with uh, graphical PCs, with smartphones. Weirdly missing from this slide is the cloud. Cloud's been around since uh, 2006 or so, Amazon was launched, and yet we still don't have a native programming model that kind of fits the physics of the cloud and allows people to take advantage of its unique properties of being global and having thousands or millions of computers at our fingertips and having all this data at our fingertips. We're still writing programs for the cloud as if we were writing them for our laptop. It's kind of crazy. And so a big question in my research group is how will folks program the cloud in ways that foster the unexpected innovation that the cloud you know, presents with a new platform? And I'll say that distributed programming is hard, right? There's lots of things that are hard about making lots of computers work together. Um, and the way we want programs to grow and shrink and, and sort of um, minimize our costs when it's not being used and scale up when it is being used. All that stuff just makes this programming problem really difficult. So I think this is one of the grand challenges in computing today. A uh, uh, few of us groups are really working hard on this. My group at Berkeley is one, um, and uh, I think there's been a lot of progress. From the cloud vendors, we're starting to see interest as well. So back in as long ago as 2014, although it really didn't come to the fore to the last few years, Amazon launched a service called Lambda. And there's been copycat services now at Microsoft and Google. And the idea is what's called functions as a service or FAS. So what's the idea? You write a little function, say in JavaScript or Python, your favorite language, and you launch it up into the cloud. What's a function? It's something that takes an input, produces an output. Okay? Put this thing in the cloud and a platform for FAS will auto scale for you to allocate resources dynamically to match your usage. So if you have a million users who want to run your function, it'll run on lots of computers. If you have no users using your function right now, it won't use any compute and it'll essentially bring your cloud bill down to zero. So you're paying for, you're sort of doing pay as you go, paying for as much as your users are using. And all you did was write a function as if it was running on your laptop. So you didn't have to think about the cloud. It scaled up and down for you. So it's pretty attractive actually. It's pretty attractive. But unfortunately, it's got some severe limitations. So the promise is this like boundless programmable cloud, right? I've got millions of machines and exabytes of data, and I get on my keyboard and I write a program and I launch it into that environment. The truth is much more like this. It's what I call an elastic army of incommunicado amnesiacs. What do I mean by this? Let me be specific. We actually wrote a paper um, Joey Gonzalez was a co-author on this with me, um, kind of critiquing the state of serverless a few years ago, and it's still pretty accurate. So 
Yes, we have boundless compute, and that is great. So that's that's a step forward for sure, this auto-scaling and the lessons that were learned in building it. But we're still basically auto-scaling a single node's worth of compute. So you can write this function on your laptop, launch it into the cloud, and it's as if your laptop has now been replicated in the cloud. So it's as much compute as one laptop, laptop can do, but lots of people can access a private laptop to do it. What it's not doing is taking advantage of the cloud as a distributed computing platform with millions of machines, because these guys are not allowed to talk to each other. That's why I say they're incommunicado. Uh, one of the restrictions in fast platforms is the functions have no network inputs. They can't hear from anyone. They just run all by themselves, right? So there's no distributed computing on the world's biggest distributed computing platform. It's just a complete miss. We don't get any of the benefits of the cloud scale. Worse, or maybe not worse, equally bad, there's no low latency access to data or storage. These functions actually are ephemeral. They will reboot every few minutes and then they'll have amnesia. They will forget everything they used to know when they reboot because they don't have any near-term storage. They can't scribble down notes to themselves in case they die and come back. The only way that your cloud function can store things is to go to a slow storage service at some other part of the cloud. Like you can go to Amazon S3, Amazon DynamoDB, but the latencies to get from your cloud function to those things are very high. And they're also expensive. You have to pay per read and per write with those services. So it's an expensive, slow storage medium. Imagine you had a laptop with a disk drive that was really slow, like really slow and expensive. That's kind of what serverless functions are right now. And so you tend not to do storage and then you just forget everything. So that's the amnesia part. So these are incommunicado amnesiacs, not a, a real realization of the cloud's potential. All right, why didn't they just make them stateful? Why can't we have communication and, and storage inside our functions? Well, it's a hard problem. So when you have distributed computing and you have the same data value replicated in multiple places, it's really hard to make sure that it's consistent in all those places. So this challenge of consistency Imagine we have this couple and they agree on a piece of data, X. They agree that it equals love, right? But X is a mutable variable, it might change. Either of them could write to X. And suppose that they get separated by a slow network and now one of them believes that X is poop. Now they disagree. And worse, they'll start to take local actions based on their disagreement. So they're far apart and the person on the right is off assuming love is in the air and doing fateful things person on the left is, is assuming it's all poop and doing fateful things. And by the time they talk to each other and understand that there was a misunderstanding, they've taken so many fateful steps, you can't put it back together. This is sometimes called split brain in a distributed program where you have wildly inconsistent views of the world and you can't put it back together. Now you may know that database systems are supposed to solve this and they use techniques like transactions and consensus. You may have heard of these things. It's kind of hardcore data systems back back-end stuff, and that's true. These things do solve the problem, but they're very heavyweight. They use a technique called coordination, which is a way of getting a whole bunch of computers to talk to each other and agree on something. So you can think of it as like computing by committee, and you know how things work by committee, right? It's a recipe for delay while you're waiting for everybody to talk to each other and figure out if they agree. And once you have delay, you start to get pile-ups of other requests behind that delay, and queues build up, and entire clouds come down. So literally, uh, many of the cloud vendors um, will discourage or prevent their employees from using coordination in implementations. Much better to just act locally in my little function and hope for the best. Now in serverless functions, there's no memory, so you can always uh, act locally because no one can hear what you're doing anyhow. But if we wanted to have state in our functions, how would we know it's safe to compute without coordination? And when do we need to use coordination? So this is actually an interesting problem that we worked on in research. Suppose you understood everything about your program. Which programs can be made to work without coordination? Call those the coordination-free programs. Which programs absolutely require coordination? No smart developer in the world could possibly write this program as according to spec without using coordination. So this is a theory question that hadn't been asked or answered till about 10 years ago when I brought it up. It has been asked and answered since. It's a theorem called the CALM theorem. And it says that programs can run in a distributed environment and get consistent outcomes without coordination if and only if they have a property called monotonicity. 
they're monotonic. Okay, let me give you an example. Twitter, uh, much in the news these days, but take any threaded uh, communication uh, platform. It's basically a bunch of trees that grow, right? You do a tweet and then somebody responds to it. It's like a child of that tweet. And somebody might respond to the response and that's a grandchild of the tweet. So we're building these trees. And when you post to Twitter, what you're doing is you're adding a node and a parent pointer to this tree and you're telling the world about it. And everybody eventually will get your post and they'll plug it into the tree. So the worst thing that can happen in Twitter is you do a post that's referencing, a, right, so we're just, sorry, this is an illustration of what it means to do a post. You add a node and a parent pointer. The worst thing that can happen in Twitter is you add a post and you're pointing to some tweet that somebody else hasn't received yet. You know, so my friend posted that they're really sick and I post back, hope you feel better. If somebody were to just get hope you feel better pointing to null, which does occasionally happen in Twitter, it's confusing. But that can be solved at the client. The client can simply not show me this purple node and, and pointer here until the client also gets the parent, right? So this worst case can totally be fixed locally without any coordination. Twitter and these Twitter threads is totally monotone. We're just adding nodes and edges to this tree. It's just growing and growing. No coordination is required. Updates can come in any order. We could take two trees and merge them together. Everything can just merge uh, monotonically growing as it comes. Here's a counter example, a database log. This is why databases are heavyweight. They have this log of all the actions that happened in order. So it's a totally ordered list. Very similar to a tree, you'd think. So here we're gonna add a node and it's gonna point to its predecessor, right? So we're gonna add a node, say, I wanna point to this predecessor and you tell the world. The worst case here is that somebody else also wants to add a node pointing to that predecessor and they come in, maybe in some places they come in first in some places they come in second. What are we gonna do with this purple thing? Well, in a totally ordered list, we can't have both of these things pointing to the same predecessor. So we'll have to like delete one of them and install it, right? That deletion is non-monotone. We said, hey, there was a node that pointed to something. And then we said, oh, just kidding. It wasn't pointing to that. It was pointing to something else. We changed our mind. So it's not just the accrual of a bunch of information. This is true, this is true, this is true. It's a case where you're saying something's true and then you're saying, actually, you know what? It's false, I, I take it back. That's what's called non-monotone, that toggling between true and false. And the only way to get this right is to coordinate. We're gonna to have to have all the computers agree that exactly one node gets the point to this parent. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of the difference between monotonicity and non-monotonicity. If you wanna learn more, we have an overview paper. It's just six pages for a general computing audience that you can read in the communications of the ACM uh, from last September. Why should you care? because we can build functions as a service now with monotonic state, and we can actually wrap up your Python programs or what have you, your functions, to ensure that they're monotone uh, by just kind of wrapping your objects with a little metadata. So we were able to build a functions as a service thing with state cached up in the compute layer. And you could do your writes up in the compute layer, auto scale the compute layer separate from the storage layer. And even if two different functions are writing the same object in their cache, they can merge in the back end, the way we merge those Twitter trees. There's no conflicts. The other challenge we addressed in Cloudburst is fault tolerance. What if a stateful function is doing 17 things, writing it to storage, and it dies halfway through? What do you do with that messy stuff on disk? And we borrowed techniques from databases to make sure this is atomic, that a function either runs in its entirety or not at all. So Cloudburst deals with consistency and fault tolerance issues. And I should mention the two students who uh, did this work, Vikram and Chen Gang. Uh, Chen Gang actually won uh, the ACM Sigma dissertation award for this work. It's a real landmark, uh, his work in data management. Vikram also, a very uh, stellar student. So they were two students in the RISE lab at Berkeley. And we built this system and then we benchmarked it on prediction serving. So this is an example where we took a three-stage mobile net uh, model. Uh, and the three stages of the pipeline were some data wrangling, and then you run the model and you post-process the results so they can be rendered. And this was a relatively small model, as most models are. So, you know, on a laptop, it runs pretty fast, 200 milliseconds latency. When you run it in the cloud on an auto-scaling service, you might think that, you know, well, it's gonna be a little slower because the cloud is, I don't know, doing a bunch of cloudy stuff. And indeed, in AWS Lambda, it's like five times or six times slower than running it on your laptop. Because those serverless functions are stateless and they're going back and forth to a storage system in the background. Um, and that storage system is high latency. And so all those round trips to storage are costing you like 6X 
what it would be to run on your laptop. Cloudburst is nearly as fast as your laptop, even at the P99, even in the, the, the cases where you're at the tail of the distribution. Interestingly, we also ran this on AWS SageMaker, which is a purpose-built machine learning system. Mind you, Cloudburst is not designed originally for machine learning inference. SageMaker is, and still Cloudburst is like almost twice as fast as SageMaker. So we're really excited about the idea that you can have these stateful serverless functions and use them in the environment uh, of um, uh, prediction. So takeaways on uh, the state of the cloud, uh, the programmable cloud is coming. Current fast offerings are not there yet, but we do have this technology and it'll get out there one way or another. Okay, um, time is a little short, so I'm gonna skip through a few things rather quickly, but I wanna give you a flavor of what it meant to take research and bring it to practice. Um, Joey and I took these two things, Clipper and Cloudburst. We brought them together in the RISE lab at Berkeley, which is where uh, we were co-directors. And we built something called Cloudflow, which was stateful serverless pipelines in the cloud to demonstrate that we could do exactly what we're describing here. Um, but then we asked the question, will it have impact if we really build this? You know, or is it just a research curiosity? And for that, we took some lessons from my past uh, startup uh, iteration with Trifacta, which is you first go off and you talk to users. Because we're academics, we do this pretty rigorously. We use qualitative social science techniques um, where you go off, you talk to users, and you use qualitative methods to bring back uh, insights. We wrote a paper about this in data analysis and visualization for Trifacta. It recently won a Test of Time award. So the value is not just to building the company. The whole community benefited from this, and this has been recognized. So Sean Candell was the grad student and my co-founder at Trifacta. Um, really deserves a lot of credit for having done the hard work and sharing it with the community. And then, of course, you built a prototype. That prototype garnered a lot of usage. Ideally, then, you take your open source and you iterate with users, and it just becomes harder, you know, hardened and more featureful over time. With a visual tool like Data Wrangler, that is less frequent. Open source visualization isn't really a thing so much. And so we ended up doing the alternative, which is just get lots of self-service users. We were fortunate to partner with Google Cloud. They released Trifecta as a product called Data Prep. So we were able to get that virtuous cycle with users and learn from them. So we're doing this again now with the uh, machine learning ops stuff. This is a paper that's hot off the presses. We interviewed, I think it was 18 machine learning engineers about where the joys and pains are so that we could learn from them and try to make that stuff uh, uh, exposed to the community as problems to work on together. Um, this paper is actually under review for a conference, but in the meantime, it's available online. I, I encourage you to have a look. And so, as we took this stuff and started to build Aqueduct, which is the open source product that um, is supported by the Aqueduct company, you know, some of the lessons were go know the user. And what we learned from that is, first of all, it's got to be super simple in Python. And second of all, not only go live is important, but thrive is important. So keeping the cycle flowing is key to the user experience and key to the value of the product. Things like telemetry, super important in this environment. And then the other thing we learned is that people don't want to use Cloudburst. They never heard of it. They want to use their favorite deployment environments. Some of them want to use AWS Lambda because it's simple. Yeah, it's a little slow. Oh, well. And some of them want to like roll their own, maybe even reinvent Cloudburst right, by using things like Kubernetes and Airflow. And great. So Aqueduct will support you uh, throughout that spectrum of simple to controlled. So I, I won't say more about Aqueduct, but the simple tagline, turn your data science projects into repeatable workflows, really with just a few lines of Python. That's how you get your, your Thrive virtuous cycle. Um, there's, I won't go through code, but if you go to aqueducthq.com, you can kind of see how you would modify your code to use Aqueduct. The first line of the first cell here gives you a flavor of it's just a simple decorator. From that decorator, we can then generate really simple to understand pipelines from your Python code, or you can go from this view back to the Python code and, and work with it. And it connects to lots of data sources and it connects to lots of compute environments as well. Okay, I wanna close the talk with some of the lessons about doing machine learning in production that we learned from users. So Shreya and Rolando get the credit for this work. Shreya is a very visible person on Twitter in the machine learning ops space. She has years of experience in the field before she became a PhD student. I encourage you to follow her. Rolando also has uh, experience in the field as well as being a PhD student. So here's one of the quotes, sort of telling quotes um, from the paper. And the paper's full of these. So it's on pipelines. And uh, so this is a machine learning engineer at a cybersecurity company. You end up with this pipeline jungle in their environment where everything's super entangled, it's really hard to make changes, and you have to hold so much context in your brain 
So if you think about all the Python code that gets written in these environments and you don't have any management tools, this is what you end up with, right? Another thing from a machine learning engineer to finance company, metrics. So this is the feedback loop in some sense of uh, the virtuous cycle. I have no idea how well models actually perform on live data in their environment. We do log the feature and output data, but feedback is always delayed by at least two weeks. It's the number one problem. Okay, and of course, that's one person's perspective. We talked to 18 people, but some of these quotes were chosen because they were representative of what we were hearing from lots of folks. Getting that feedback loop flowing, the Thrive part of Go Live and Thrive is a real world challenge that everybody's wrestling with. So much more in this paper I'd encourage you to look at. In the interest of time, I'll go very quickly through the Aqueduct user interviews, which are you know, uh, not documented in a research paper. Here's one from uh, Replate. Our previous infrastructure was built by data scientists and engineers with little knowledge of each other's best practices. Again, that picture I showed before, the data scientists, the machine learning engineers, they're separated from each other. And the goal with Aqueduct is to streamline the machine learning engineering part so the production data science has a simple Pythonic API to get models into production. And he just focuses on delivering better models rather than maintaining cloud infrastructure. So it can be done and Aqueduct can help do it. And then on metrics, you know, I won't read it out, but again, if you have infrastructure like Aqueduct to help you get the metrics, you know, just uh, as a matter of deployment, metrics come for free. Uh, it makes a huge difference to an organization. Okay, so with that, my time is about up. Takeaways from folks, production data science, this heavy MLOps infrastructure is an anti-pattern. Try to not invest too much in MLOps because it's just so heavyweight. You want to skip it. You want to get those domain aware data scientists into the virtuous cycle, go live and thrive. For those of you who are interested in tech transfer, you know, the way we do it at Berkeley, we start with a research problem, which is really just a dissatisfaction with the state of the art. Why does the world have to be the way it is? Why can't we make it better? But then something we do uniquely at Berkeley is we do we ground the work in the real world. We talk extensively with users, we do the social science. Then we imagine what could be better and we make it so, and that's the computer science invention part. And then you iterate and then eventually graduate into a useful tool, right? So we iterate in research to get good research prototypes, and then we take them out into the field. Aqueduct is an instantiation of this tech transfer model to help with production data science, uh, and I encourage you to have a look at it. For more information, it's open on GitHub, it's open source. The website for Aqueduct is aqueducthq.com and it'll show you some simple examples. If you're interested in my research, you're welcome to go to my page at Berkeley or reach out uh, via your favorite communication medium. Thanks for your time.